Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, there was a, as I said, there was a person, a lady that was here last week. Uh, her name was Elaine, and she's been on our prayer chain um, for the next little while, just for John. I told her of a story. I'm going to tell you the story because that's why I really believe in the healing power of Jesus because he's still in the healing business today. Amen? Yeah, you believe that? Yeah. I remember when I was pastoring church. This is not in the notes, so it's free. I was pastoring in northern Ontario, and uh, it was a small church, and, and I'm on the platform getting ready for the service, and one of the board members comes up and says, there's a gentleman by the name of John in the lobby. Uh, he wants you to come and pray for him. I'm like, it's three minutes till the service starts. He says, he really needs to see you right now. He can't save for the service. He doesn't look well. And my, one of my board members actually said, he looks like he's got one foot in this world, one foot in the grave, and they're both on a bar of soap. I'm like, okay. So I went and I said to the, one of the other worship leaders that was helping, I said, can you just start? I'll be there when I can. I went to him and he said to me this. He said, Pastor, I attended this service of this church a couple of weeks ago and I heard the message of the gospel for the first time in a long time. He says, I want you to preach my funeral, if you would. I'm thinking, oh, okay. He says, they give me a week to two weeks to live. He said, my body is filled with cancer. He says, I'm dying. He looked like he was. I said, okay, I'll do your funeral. I said, but can I pray for you first? He said, well, yeah, what good will it do? And I didn't pray. I was a young preacher. I, I didn't know what I know now. I just prayed this simple little prayer the best I could because it kind of caught me off guard and he left and had to have someone help him down into the car. They drove away and so that was in March of that year and several months had passed by and, and I was doing worship at the family camp, Silver Birch's camp in uh, Kirkland Lake, Ontario and uh, it was a Saturday morning that I had to do this funeral uh, for this baby that was two years old. She had been born with part of her brain out her eye socket, and she lived to be two, and it was a very hard funeral. There was, the police had to be involved because there was hatred between family members and, and that. Uh, the grandmother and the mother both collapsed, had to be dragged uh, by the ushers to the graveside. And here I am, I have to go that night to lead worship at the Pentecostal camp, opening night for the service, for the camp. I'm thinking, I'm driving up, I'm thinking, God, I can't do this. I don't have it in me. I said, how am I supposed to lead? They're expecting, you know, that we had a complete band, everything there. Like, and they expected a good old-fashioned Pentecostal church service Saturday night, camp style. I'm like, God, I just don't have it in me. So as I'm going up there, I, I still get emotional because the, the feelings and emotions are still very real to me. And I remember going up there and said, God, I said, if you don't go with me, I can't do this. And then we're driving up. I don't know if you've ever been at Silver Birch's camp. You kind of come down the road and kind of veers off the left and go up the little hill there. So Doris, one of our organ players at the church, I saw her standing with a couple of other people. And a couple of people I didn't recognize, some I did. And we're talking back and forth. And I'm explaining the situation to me. She said, well, Pastor, we'll pray for you. And this man looks at me and says, Pastor, you don't recognize me now, do you? I said, not really. He says, I'm John. I said, seriously? He says, yes. He says, I know what was in that prayer. <laughs> Neither do I. He said to me, he said, but God completely healed me. I have no cancer now. <laughs> Story gets better. Story gets better. He said, but I have another request from you. I said, what's that? I said, can you do my wedding now? He says, I'm, I want to marry Doris. And I looked at him, and it was about a year between the time that I prayed for him and got married. I said, can I share your story? So I did. And then at the altar of the church, I said, John I said I could share this story. And I told him the story. I said, John, I'd rather perform your wedding than your funeral any day. I think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that there was a person that is suffering with esophagus cancer that's gone through the body into the liver and other organs of the body named John that we can pray for. So whenever you're thinking through a disease, just let the prayer up for John. The God will heal him. I've seen too many miracles to dismiss the power of God. Amen? Take your Bibles, if you will, and I, I want to go through 
um, today, starting a new series on the people that Jesus ministered to. Um, and then after we're done, we're going to pray, then uh, we're going to have the baptism service, and there'll be a little music video that kind of goes with, it's kind of like the theme of this series. So we'll I'll get you a turn to John 4, John chapter 4, and um, the title of the message is called The Adulterous Woman. John chapter 4, <laughs> I don't know if they have it on there or not, uh, but you have your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles next week, Bring your Bible. We've gotten out of that, haven't we? We've gotten out. I don't care if you have bring it on your smart device or whatever. Uh, I find it easier because of the backlit to be able to read on, on a smart device. But bring your Bible. We need to bring the Word of God with us. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had uh, heard that he was gaining, uh, ga- was gaining and baptized more than uh, John, disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. If you have your Bibles, you need to underline that phrase, that verse, that part of that verse, because that's a key pivotal point of this entire message. He had to go through Samaria. So when he came to the, sound, uh, to the town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground, Jacob had given it to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired, and as he was from the journey, uh, from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you uh, give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you uh, living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw the water in the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, and did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming to here to draw water. And Jesus, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man you are now living with is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but the Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming. When you will worship the Father, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship, um, uh, we worship what we do know, for salvation is that comes is from of, from the Jews. Yet a time is coming. And now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are uh, the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus said, declare, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Father, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You see, the opportunities for ministry do not always arrive and come at convenient times. The choices of who we would like to see saved always don't come when we want or who even who we think should be saved. In fact, many of the greatest moments of leading others to Christ will come unexpected and maybe from people that we ordinarily would not have chosen to lead to Christ. Let's face it, we all have our preferences. Christ's passion was winning the lost. It should be ours. 
and seeking out the lost. It did not matter to him whether they were Gentile, whether they were Jew, whether they were male or female, poor or rich, is that fact that they were all lost without him. Someone once said that God's salvation takes into account the lost, the last, and the least. We cannot afford to, to bypass anyone in witnessing. God has called us to be a witness. Everyone is a candidate to hear the, the message of God for salvation, and every Christian is a witness of God's salvation. You may not be able to preach a three-point homiletically correct sermon. That's okay. But let me ask this question. I want you to lift your hand. How many of you can say that God has touched your life and done something in your life? Let me see your hands. Come on, lift them up. That's what they want to hear, and that's what they need to hear. Your testimony. You can argue theology all you want. You can't argue a testimony. What God has done, what God means to you, what, how he has impacted your life. God is calling each of you, each one of you, to share the message of the gospel with those who come your way, whether it's a convenient time or not. I'm tired of hearing people say, hearing people say, I'm too shy or, 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 or not able to share Christ with people. If you're telling me this this morning, that you can share the gospel with people, and that you're telling me that you can, then, then you're telling me that God has done nothing in your life. Because that's what sharing the gospel literally is. Telling others what the Lord has done, or maybe God has done nothing for you. And that will explain why you don't share. But I doubt there's a person in this room that could actually say that. God has done nothing for me. Do me a favor. Pause for a sec. Go new little exercise. I want you to do what I do. Ready? Do it. The very fact that you can do that is God. One day a lady was criticizing D.L. Moody for his methods of evangelism and attempted, in, in attempting to win people for the Lord. Moody's reply was, I agree. I don't like the way I do it either. Tell me how you do it, to which the lady replied, I don't do it. To which Moody said, then I like the way that I'm doing it better than the way you're not doing it. I have heard every excuse in the book for not sharing our faith, for not getting involved. Understand this, we are all tired. We are all busy. We all have hectic schedules, and, but nothing should deter us from the greatest mission of mankind, and that's sharing the message of Christ's salvation. Jesus utilized every single moment to reach out, even when exhausted. The Bible teaches us that the very contact with others is an opportunity for us to share our faith. There is no one excluded from God's love. I don't care how bad that person is. Jesus reached out to touch even the morally lax with the offer of salvation. Doesn't matter if they had everything right. Doesn't matter if their, their, their language wasn't all that perfect. Doesn't matter if their lifestyles are not what we think they should be. Sure got an amen on that one. Because we all will stand before God one day. And the Bible tells us, so if you take your notes, write this down, the mission. Jesus was systematic. See, he was passionate about his mission. He traveled extensively and systematically as much as possible. Even in this passage, it says he had to go through Samaria. He just had to. The necessity was, wasn't as much as geographical as it was in the mission itself. 
Christ refused to take the long way around the territory of the Samaritans just to avoid contact with them. Necess- necessity of getting to the next place often meant taking the shortest route possible, which was the direct route right through Samaria. How many have ever put on your GPS on your, in your car and said you want to take the fastest route to get to your destination? How many have done that? I have. And it usually takes you to a, through some other way. Any normal Jewish individual would have avoided Samaria, if at all possible, since the Samaritans and Jews had a very, very poor relationship with one another. They despised each other. I bet you if we were truly honest, there's probably people we could mention that we just don't like. Oh, don't look at me like that. You're not that holy. Neither am I. And if I would even go as far as to say that probably people that we would sit there and say, I despise that person. I remember being in one church, not this one, so don't try to figure out who it is. I remember being in one church where there was a group of people, this one family and this other family, they actually said this words. I despise, and they mentioned the person's name. Let's call them uh, the Josephs. I despise the Josephs. I'm thinking, how can you call yourself a believer if you despise someone? Now, I will grant that not everyone is easy to get along with. I know I, I'm perfectly well getting along with. Okay, you laughed just a little too quick. Seriously thinking, saying though, I know that each one of us, myself included, are not always the easiest to get along with. <laughs> the things I do, the things you do, other people that just mm, rub us the wrong way. Some of you purposely avoid sharing your faith with your family, your friends, or your neighbors. And here's the one thing I want to ask if you don't, who will? There was, a long, there was a long-standing feud going back to, to a time hundreds of years before this situation when, when some poor Jews who were left behind in the captivity, swept, uh, uh, captivity sweep married non-Jews and became, in their eyes, impure. Jesus, however, refuses to be ruled by prejudice. He sees people, all people the same, all in need of a Savior. He came for the world. For Christ, ministry is not a duty, it is a passion. As Christian, this should be our attitude as well. It's not enough to hope for the harvest. It's not enough to pray for the harvest. Jesus made himself available to make it happen also. If you want to harvest, then start planting something. It's that simple. See, one person said this, everybody wants a harvest, but few want to plow. Everyone wants to experience a move of God. So let me ask this question. How many here would lift their hand and say, I want to see a move of God in this place? Do you? Huh. Then how come we're not willing to pay the price? See, no revival ever just happened. Someone has to pay the price. The first part of that price is prayer and lots of it. So who this morning wants to see a revival breakthrough, Chad McCann? Then why aren't we here when we call for prayer meetings? Ouch. It's okay to say ouch, by the way. Why do other activities sometimes take precedence over church? Why do we leave the work of the gospel and ministry up to everyone else? Well, someone else will do it, will they? The answer is we really don't want God to move because if we did, we would seek him with all of our hearts. We would take every opportunity to serve in the kingdom. Christ looked at this very moment as an open opportunity to reach someone 
We as Christians would do well to emulate him in this. So often we pray for the harvest, but this is wrong. God send in the harvest. Did you know that's not actually a real biblical prayer? Pray for the harvest. I love what Jesus says. He said, he, he said, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore send workers out into the harvest field. Are you aware that right now that Chatham Kent is primed for a move of God? There are people in your very backyard that want to hear the message of the gospel and want to hear something real because of all the fake, phony crap they're seeing on TV. There is a harvest, and it's waiting for us just to go and grab it. It's a turnkey operation, folks. The only thing that's lacking is workers. Jesus did this sacrificially. He was exhausted, and and in territory where the Jews would be unwelcomed. And it was at noon where the heat of the day was so hot and so terrible, hence his thirst. And he had just finished a grueling time of ministry to huge crowds before stopping there. And since the disciples had gone into the town to buy food, he was probably very hungry. Jesus was a man as well. Jesus had every excuse to avoid ministry to, to anyone else that came into contact with him. He had every right to sit and say, call my office and make an appointment. Most of us would have said that. And most of us would probably sit there and say, I deserve some time away from myself. And sometimes we do. Instead of some well-deserved rest, Jesus finds himself coming face to face with a Samaritan woman of very questionable character. So what will he do? What would you do? I've met some very questionable character people in my life. I seem to draw them to me. My father-in-law says to about my wife and I, says, you and Jenny have this unique ability to draw those that are just a little bit odd. <laughs> and that, that's okay. Because they need Christ. And maybe it's because I'm a little odd myself. I'm not going to insult my wife, but I can salt me. Well, she knows he's weird anyway. Many times we find ourselves in a situation where understandably we could relax and yet we are faced with someone who needs a minute. So often we, our own need then has to take a back seat to the greater need of the other person. Jesus eventually would lay down his life for us, but he showed this trait long before the cross. Long before the cross. Before I move to my next point, I want to say this. When my son was in, in, in Windsor going through cancer treatment, he would go every two weeks for four to five days, and he would stay there and get four to five cancer treatments per day that lasted anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes each one. There was a time that he uh, fell, he was disoriented, and anyone ever been in hospital for any length of time, you know the delirium, the delusion, and the confusion that can set in your mind. It's like a different world all by itself. He fell, didn't know where he was, so I stayed there. I would drive through to Windsor and stay there at night, come back here for 7 o'clock in the morning, pray for several hours, meet with the staff, uh, do what I have to do, go have lunch. Jenny and I would drive through to Windsor to be with Matthew, come back, have dinner with my other two boys, drive back to Windsor, stay overnight. Did that for six months, every two weeks, for five days. Put a lot of miles on my car. It got to the point I would just put the cruise and just sit there. I'm surprised I didn't get pulled over because, you know, you get to the place and you're driving to a certain distance that's a long way away. You don't really always do the speed limit. Not going to say what I did, but I just, you just don't because you're like, I just got to get there. So I would go to the hospital staff and you'd be surprised what you can hear and see. And they 
opportunities that the Holy Spirit can open for you when you make yourself available. I'll go to the desk, the head desk of the nurse station, and I handed them my card and said, Hi, I'm Pastor Eric. I, I'm the lead pastor at Glad Tidings in Blender. My son is here. <coughs> I said, If any of the people on this floor need prayer, want to talk to someone, I'm making myself available. I said to the nurses and the doctors, I said, if you need prayer, I said, you guys go through hell on earth. Many times when I would walk by, when we would go there, I would see uh, a bed with a crowd of people around the bed. You knew what was happening. I'll never forget why I heard we were redirected because uh, when we came in for the one of the visit to stay there, we came in and we heard on there, Code Omega, um, um, oncology floor, Code Omega, massive blood loss. You, you, you'd be surprised what you see. I'd be lying on this, I don't even know what they would call it. And I would put on my phone some rain music in the background because it's really hard to sleep when you're in that type of setting. Didn't get much sleep. Because Matthew would stir throughout the night and I'd have to tend to him and take care of him. But one of the unique, amazing things that actually happened was this. Remember the first time, my second visit, the first night a nurse comes and I'm kind of half drifted off to sleep. She shakes me and says, did you mean it when you said that you would pray for someone? I said, definitely, I had to kind of shake myself away. Said, yeah, yeah. She says, can you come with me? So I get up and I go, and there's this person that's in bed. He's hooked up to every single solitary machine you could possibly think of. I almost couldn't get near him. I brought my little anointing oil with me. I almost couldn't get in to see him, to touch him, because of all the machines and the wires and the hoses and everything on him. So I said, I'm going to pray for him. And they, they said, we don't know if he'll make it through the night. We have him somewhat sedated, but he is conscious. He can't respond. So I shared the message of the gospel with this person. And I was blunt. I didn't sit there and say, everything's going to be okay. Because it wasn't. As I'm sharing the message with this gospel, I said to him, I think, it, actually, I think his name was John. What's with John's? I said, John, <coughs> I said, you're going to die tonight. Are you prepared to see God? To which he kind of half, his eyes kind of half open like this, shook his head no. I said, well, would you like to be prepared? kind of nodded. He couldn't speak. He had tubes down him. I said, I would like to lead you. So I shared with him what the gospel message was very quick. I said, would you like to ask Jesus into your heart and into your life? He shook his head, yes. So I led him in that prayer of asking Jesus into his life. That morning he was gone. There were probably a dozen or so people that I had the opportunity to pray with. I have a book by the father of one of the cancer patients that was there that had cancer. He eventually died, and I was able to pray. My son Matthew was sharing a room with him, and this, you know, this man died of cancer, lung cancer. You never know how the Lord will open up a door for you to be able to minister to somebody. Write this down, the message. The message is salvation. Jesus himself is exhausted, facing a very needy lady. She was a Samaritan woman. She was, the Samaritans were hostile. Jesus doesn't see, however, a hopeless case. There are no hopeless cases. I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care those of you that are watching us online. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what other people have told you, the lies from the pit of hell that someone's told you that, okay, you're done, you're useless, you're, you're hopeless. There are no racial barriers or someone who may make him ceremonial unclean. He only saw someone 
who needed forgiveness. It's important not to ignore those around us who are in need. See, the world has more winnable people now than ever. The world's greatest need is not material in nature, and while it's important for us to do as much as we can to help others in the material way, uh, we are not to ignore the spiritual nature of the world's need. Jesus attempts to get this woman to recognize her true need. She's thinking in terms of physical water at first, and, and she would be happy to have this special water from Jesus. She wouldn't have to come to the well to draw from the well anymore, but Jesus moves her from the physical to the spiritual need. Like so many today, once it's clear that Jesus is driving home a spiritual issue, the things happening in your life, the struggles, the challenges you're having, that are happening in life may just be the Lord wanting to get a hold of your life to get your attention. She began to argue theological and forms of religion. This has always been the way people attempt to avoid the real issues of their soul. Gain to an argument over religion. How about you? Her di diversion tactics, however, fail because Jesus puts the issue back on her and her needs. See, Jesus exposes her sinfulness. And while Jesus may have been able to guess she was a woman of low, low moral standards by the fact that she came to draw water during the hottest part of the day instead with the other women at dusk or at dawn, there was no way someone be, would be able to guess the, 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 her five other sexual affairs and the present one she was now in. Her response to Jesus' exact details is a final acknowledgement to, of the spiritual dynamics of Christ. She is in need. She's in need. It was bad enough that the Samaritan woman could only see the material realm at first. Now Jesus returns, and they are frustrated that Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, but they say nothing. They don't get it. They just don't get it. She could never have expected that she, what she found but it was her greatest joy. It's ironic that the disciples of Jesus didn't want Jesus bothering with this woman, yet she's in town witnessing to everyone. How many of us at church will see someone who comes that may just be a little questionable? And we are in our pious contemplation, look down upon that person and say, see the way they're dressed? Did you know I saw them out at the smoking section having a cigarette? Oh. By the way, yes, we have a smoking section here at the church. We're the only church in town that does. Because I'd rather have people come to the church that still smoke and struggle with that and say, hey, I'm going to go have a smoke break, come back in and listen to the service, than to say, hey, you don't accept me. So we have a smoking section up by the gym door. So if you need a smoke, go have a smoke. Just say. But then we look at them and we look down upon them sometimes. I've done it. Yeah, I find that these are the people that are out witnessing, telling others about what God has done in their lives. Huh. She wanted to shout from the streets her newfound joy of having Jesus come into her life. And although she was an outcast in so many ways, God saw value in her, and she became a daughter of God through Christ. Doesn't matter what she did in the past. Didn't matter what she was doing right then and here and now. She had a need. And every single one of us in this room, every single one that witnessed that today, we all have sin in our lives and all of us need a Savior. Many people in the town believed Christ because of her witness, and they too made their way out to see Jesus. Here is a woman of questionable character evangelizing. And the disciples just don't get it. 
from a simple encounter to minister to an adulterous woman, an entire Samaritan village found the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation. The entire town comes to know Christ. Oh, my word, that's amazing. All in, in, in all of this, Jesus has to teach his own disciples about the importance of keeping a priority on ministry when it presents itself. Not on food, rest, or anything else. Not on politics. They went into town to buy bread. She went to town to give bread to, of life to everyone. What about us? Can we get lost in our own little world of happy worship of the Lord and forget about the kinds of people that Jesus ministered to and wants to minister to? Do we who have Christ get too caught up in the material things that we forget the importance of the spiritual realm? Is there a woman at the well in our lives? Someone who is desperately needs Christ. And are we too busy or too tired to reach out to this person? Or do, or do we just don't like them enough to see them saved? Though Jesus had originally taken a shortcut through Samaria to, get, to obviously get through he, there quickly, he instead stays two extra days to minister to these hungry and thirsty souls. Let me close with this. Though exhausted from a busy schedule, Jesus found both the time and the energy to minister to someone whose lifestyle and values were not even accepted by the ungodly citizens around her. Are we sensitive to the spiritual needs of those around us, or does our busy lives keep us from ministry? Shouldn't the passion and the mission of Jesus be ours too? Father, we thank you. We thank you for this story because this woman was an outcast. She didn't even go when the rest of the women went down to get water. She went in the most awkward time because she had a life of shame. Maybe, God, she was just too tired of the gossip. Why do we gossip, Lord? Why do we allow ourselves to be used, our tongues to be used by the devil? She went at a different time so she wouldn't hear the nagging gossip of people. She was broken. Father, when, with the reality of it is, we are all broken. Many today come with a smile on their face and seemingly having their, their life together, and we try to portray that everything is just fine. But, Father, if we were truly honest, some of us would probably sit there and say, I'm just hanging on here by a thread. And we say that we're fine we're fine, we're fine, but we're not. We're broken. So, Father, I pray for those that can identify with this adulterous woman. The Father, they would find Jesus. They would find life. Father, I pray you would help us who should know better those of us who should be willing and, 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 and excited to share the message of the gospel. Father, forgive us for our false piety and our pride and our arrogance, thinking we are someone when we really aren't. Outside of you, Jesus, we have nothing, we are nothing. Father, stir our hearts. to have the heart of Jesus. 
Father, we thank you. And we praise you this morning. Lord, as we get prepared to baptize one of your saints, one of you believers who, who loves you and is growing in her faith with you. May this moment be a moment of an encounter with God. Father, may we see the witness and the testimony of this young person's life. And Father, just stand in amazement that God, you still save. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.